Okay, that's recording. The bro, bro, Wilmot gave me the instructions. So, amen. One back from the hospital because Sister Julie, they kept her in the hospital for her back. So, just do keep her in prayer. They're going to do some checkups and stuff. So, he's on his way home. Joel chapter 2, verse 23. Very familiar scripture. Joel 2, 23. Be glad then, you children of Zion, and rejoice in the Lord your God. That's a book of Joel chapter 2, verse 23. Be glad then, ye children of Zion, and rejoice in the Lord your God. For he has given you the former rain moderately, and he will cause to come down for you the rain, the former rain and the latter rain in the first month. And the floor shall be full of wheat, and the vat shall overflow with wine and oil. And I will restore to you the years that the locust has eaten, the cankerworm, the caterpillar, the palmer worm, my great army which I sent among you, and you shall eat in plenty and be satisfied, and praise the name of the Lord your God that hath dealt wondrously with you, and my people shall never be ashamed. May the Lord bless his word. <clears throat> you know, it's a familiar scripture. I know, Sister Christina, you were saying that you had been looking at that message at church. I yes, know. I actually just I finished reading and listening to it yesterday. <laughs> I will restore. And I was like, well, that's so much fit in what you're reading now. That's a powerful, powerful uh, principle, the principle of restoration, because we all need restoration. And God has promised seasons of restoration. God bless Sister Angel. God bless you as well. So we wanted to have a look at these seasons that the law sets. So I'll just share just a, a few things. Won't put too many. Oh, my, my, my. What's happening here? This is one. Uh, portion of screen. Sorry, it's not showing me my screen. Give me a second. Okay, we wanted to look at once I get the screen going, this principle of the former and the latter rain. So I wanted to share screen. Okay, I'm not sure if you can see that. You guys can see my slide there, yeah? Not yet. Oh, okay, see, Zoom is giving me a bit of a problem here. It's not allowing me to share. God bless to others who have joined as well. Sister Jim, God bless. Yeah, it's giving me a bit of a hard time here. So let me just try again. Okay, I'll try this one. I love Zoom. Sorry, it's just going to take a second here. Yeah. It's wanting me to give permission to Zoom to share my screen, so I'll say. Okay, better. that's fine. Sister Christina, you can help on this one. Um, yeah, but the one who created the meeting and who created the link, they're like uh, organizers. I'm, and I'm only joking, sister. I'm only joking. <laughs> yeah, the organizer can help, but I can't. You can see it now, yeah? Yeah. yeah. Oh, okay. That's okay. nice. Uh, Who's caused that? <laughs> so we look in form and latter rain. So this is a principle which you can take in many ways. Obviously, the important thing for us is to try to personalize issues. You now we really do desire, as much as we want to look at the conditions of our day, the promises of our day, but. It doesn't really do us much good to have a lot of knowledge, to know a lot of prophecy, to know a lot of the conditions that are promised in our age, unless we're able also to apply those principles personally inside of our spiritual lives, which I think is the most important thing. You know, like Brother Barry Coffey said that time, I never forgot his statement, that sometimes the most difficult thing is for the word to become flesh. You know, that's what we desire, is the word to become flesh. That is the Lord's desire, that he wants something to become flesh in us before we can you know, really fulfill our part in our age we need to first allow that word of promise to be made flesh in our age so you know, this one we can look at in many different ways the form and latter end but we'd like to bring it 
in a bit of a balance maybe to look at it personally and also to look at this promise of Joel that he's promised the former and the latter end. There's another scripture. Can you see that scripture just to make sure everything's working? Zechariah 10 verse 1, you can see it here? Yes, you can see it. Okay, good. Just wanted to make sure. This. So the scripture is telling us now, it's, this is a promise that the Lord has given. And I really love these kind of promises because the Lord is saying, ask ye of the Lord rain in the time of the latter rain. So the Lord shall make bright clouds and give them showers of rain to everyone grass in the field. So the Lord is telling us that you will have a lot of spiritual success if you ask for things seasonably. And I think this is where maybe a lot of disappointments, a lot of things take place. Now, we, how many times have we been through the final revival, which is going to lead to the rapture? I wonder how many times in the last 100 years, 200 years, you know, people having an expectation, obviously saints believing in the promises of our age, now, sometimes we can run ahead of God. We can take promises, and they're not really promises. We haven't yet got to the season of the promise, and yet by faith we say, this is the time for the promise. The promise must be fulfilled. And it can lead to a lot of disappointment. I know in the Seventh-day Adventist Church, if you ask Sister Kimberly, there was, they call it the Great Disappointment, 1844, I think it was, 18-something there, where you know, people were really expecting the Lord to come. People sold their lands, they sold their houses, they went up and waited in the mountain, expecting something to take place, but it wasn't quite yet the season. And that can lead to a lot of disappointment. Or if you try to think you're in a certain season and it's not quite the season, you think of Sarah with Abraham waiting for the promise. When they thought it was the season, she said to Abraham, look, this has taken a long time. I'm sure God wants the promise to be fulfilled now of the seed coming through. So I'd rather take my maidservant, take Hagar, and rather you know, marry her as your second wife and let the, the seed of promise come through her. And it complicated the whole program because they weren't working seasonably. But now when the Lord visits you in a certain season, when it's the time of the promise, then you start speaking to the Lord. Like we saw those weeks gone by with Daniel, when he started speaking to the Lord, in the season of the promise, you're going to find there's a channel opened. You're going to find things start to move. The Lord doesn't want us just to sit back and wait for the promise. No, that's not what he's saying. He wants us to discern the season. You know, his spirit will quicken you. His spirit will speak to you and say, ask me now. Seek me now. Seek my face at this time and I'll be found of you. So, you know, so that is the principle that we see here. Ask ye of the Lord reign in the time of the latter rain. So, you know, when we can find ourselves, discern that it's the season for something, and then we approach the Lord and ask him for his promise in season, you'll find he'll quicken you in the promise. There'll be a quickening inside of your soul because you've, you've hit a certain season. You're asking for the right promises at the right time. And that'll apply inside of your life as well. You know, the, the Bible says that there were certain times when Jesus went. We know it very well. It says, he went into a certain city and the power of the Lord was present to heal. You know, so there was a, the anointing was there for healing. There's other times where he'd be doing the work of an evangelist. He'd be anointed. He'd be calling people like John the Baptist, calling people to repentance. And there's a certain anointing that's there. It's the same spirit of Christ, but working in a certain way to bring forth a certain result. You know, so there's different seasons. So, there was a season where people could call upon the name of the Lord and be healed. Remember when the angel would come down on the waters at the pool of Bethsaida, where it would pool of Bethesda. And anybody who stepped into the water first after the waters were troubled would be healed. No, so then the angel would go up once again and there wouldn't be that virtue there at that season in the water. You'd have to wait for the visitation again and down the angel would come again and the waters would be troubled. And all you had to do was be the first one to step into the water. You know, so it was, it's this one of trying to work in season, you know, allowing the Lord to quicken you, allowing the promises to become real, realizing where you are and what the Lord desires to do inside of your life at that time. So what is this form and latter end when you're speaking about working seasonally? So in the East, <clears throat> if you get to the promised land, get to Palestine, any of the, the nations in the Middle East, the former rain 
it falls in the sowing time. So it's in seed time. So that's going to be around your September, October time. It is necessary in order that the seed may germinate. You know, if you try to sow the seed and the conditions are not right, you try to sow the seed in the middle of summer, you're not going to have much luck because the sun is going to bake that ground. You know, the conditions are not right. The soil, yes, it may be fertile, but there's not enough moisture to get the seed to germinate. But under the influence of these fertilizing showers, it says, the tender shoot springs up. So the seed has the life principle inside of it, just as much as God's word is a seed. And anything that we need inside of our lives that pertaining to redemption, God has given us promises. And then there's more than sufficient power and virtue in those promises to bring forth what God has promised to do in the word of God. The scripture says the word of God is alive. It's quick and it's powerful. It's a creative word. God can create with his word. He can restore with his word. He can heal. He sent his word and he healed them. So you know, whatever you're looking for, whatever need you have, the Lord, if you sense it, he will send you the word in season. And then if you are in season and your heart is prepared ground, you know, you've prepared your heart for the word, you'll find that word cannot germinate. But in order for the seed to germinate, there's got to be the right condition. So there's got to be this former rain, the showers come, they soften the earth, there's enough moisture in the ground, the farmers now discern it's the season, out they come with their plows, in goes the seed, they take advantage of these former rains. So the former rain is the planting rain. Then, Five, six months later, February, March time, March, April, you find the latter rain. The latter rain falls near the close of the season. It ripens the grain and prepares it now for the sickle. So you find the seed has been growing now through the, 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 the winter months. So it's been going through November, December, January, February. It gets to the stage that the ear of wheat you know, the, the corn is in the ear. You find it's almost ready, but it's green. Here comes the latter rain. It's really intense rainfall. We've been there in the times of latter rain before. And the rain really can come down quite fiercely in the time of latter rain. And what that does, it's not really rain that comes to make the crop grow, but it's rain that comes to mature the crop, to make sure it fills up the ear. And then now, because of the season, the sun now bakes down. You find the final quickening now to the harvest. And this prepares it now for harvest, prepares it to take it to the granary. And that's why we would believe we are in the season of the latter rain. Because the rapture, John the Baptist told us, is when the master comes with a sickle in his hand. John said his fan is in his hand. You know, he shall purge the threshing floor. Then he shall take the grain into the garner. You know, so the, the parables that, that John would use, that Jesus would use, the parable of the sower. Now, what is Jesus? What is the work of redemption to do? He wants to take his people. He wants his seed to be taken home now to the granary. So he's got to prepare the seed. He's got to get the seed right now for the harvest. And he's going to use the latter rain. He's going to, spiritually speaking, there's going to be this final quickening that has to come to quicken the church, to prepare it now for the rapture, you know, so that the master can put in the sickle and he can harvest the harvest of the earth. So that's the season that we'd be in. But a principle we need to see here is the principle of seed time and harvest. So the seed time being the former rain, harvest being the latter rain. So there's always got to be the beginning of something. You know, you can never have a harvest without seed time. No, harvest is maturity now. Harvest is when the seed, when the plant has grown, it's come up through the shoot, here comes the ear, the blade, here comes the ear, here comes the corn in the ear. So you've got to go through the cycle, but unless there's a successful seed time, unless you use the former rain successfully, you know, and you use the resources that are given in that season, you're not going to get a very good harvest. You're not going to get any harvest at all many times. And if this is true in the agricultural world, 
This is going to be true as well in your spiritual life. It, it's not the rain. Let's have a look at this principle, seed time and harvest. It's not the rain that determines what your harvest is going to be. It's the seed that you sow in the season of the former rain. Whatever seed you sow, Genesis 1.11, we looked at it the other week, every seed will bring forth after its own kind. You know, so it's not just the rain. The rain comes, but what's going to depend, determine the harvest is what seed are you sowing? Now, when you bring this to the seasons of revival, revival is like when there's the outpouring of the Holy Ghost. It's typified by rain. Yeah, and all of us love those seasons, seasons of revival inside of your life, when the Lord is pouring forth the anointing inside, the Holy Ghost inside of your experience. Now, the anointing is powerful. When there's that revival atmosphere, we grew up in one when we were back home. It's so powerful when God is visiting his people in that kind of a way. But it's not just the anointing that is sufficient because the anointing is simply the rainfall. But what brings forth the harvest inside of your life, the manifestation, the maturity, whatever it is that God has called you to do and to be, is not the anointing. The anointing is part of it, but the anointing has to be combined with the right kind of seed that's being sown in that kind of a time. That's right. You know, when you see churches in revival, which is powerful, I mean, there's many things we've seen through the years. You know, when there's that real anointing and people are coming to the altar and, you know, and prayer meetings are so quickened of the Holy Ghost and, and, and souls are coming into the kingdom, you might look at that and say, that is just so awesome. That is just so powerful. But you've got to be so careful because in that kind of a season, the harvest you get depends on the kind of seed that you sow in mm -hmm. the time of the former rain. Mm -hmm. yeah. And people can sow. You can sow an emotional seed at that time. You know, I know the prosperity gospel is very popular now. You can sow the gospel, the prosperity gospel, you know, the, like name it and claim it and all those kind of things like we see. So there's so many different types of seed that are sown when the anointing is there. And that is why we get such a variety of harvests coming from a revival. Jesus said, whenever the wheat is sown, he says the tares, the weeds, the enemy comes and sows the weed as well. That's right. You know, so when the the rain is falling when the atmosphere is there, when the conditions are right to sow, you'll find the enemy also comes in to sow his seed of discrepancy. He comes to sow his seed, you know, of, of all man's opinions, man's doctrines, all those kind of things. But if we want to get the correct harvest inside of our lives, when God is visiting you, when you know that there's a quickening power in my experience, God is visiting me at this time. That there's a, I've never felt like this in my experience. There's something which the Lord is dealing with me about. The important thing at that time, make sure you sow the correct seed so that you can bring forth the right harvest. Remember, Paul himself says it as well. Be not deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever a man sows, that shall he also reap. And I think this principle really to me has explained many, many things over the years. You know, there's people can be greatly anointed, which we're going to get on to now. Look at this. The principle of the rain falling, the former rain falling. You might go to church, the Holy Ghost falls, you blessed. You come away from there and say, that was so anointed there. But it depends on what's inside of your heart. It depends on the seed that's inside of your heart that's going to determine the harvest. Because Jesus told us that God makes his son to rise on the evil and on the good. And he sends rain on the just and the unjust. So a person who's living in sin, they might come to a revival meeting and feel just as blessed and just as anointed as a person who's walking righteously before the Lord. Because the rain falls on the just and the unjust. God's principle of life, if you sow weeds in your field, the rain's going to come and pour on that field. You're going to have showers on that field just as much as if you plant wheat in your field. So it's not the rain that determines the harvest. You need the rain. You need the anointing. We'll get onto that a bit later. 
it's absolutely imperative that at the starting point in your formative years, that you have a real spiritual something taking place inside of your life. Mm -hmm. You need the former rain. No, you need the rain so that when the seed is sown, the seed of repentance, the seed of justification, the seed of sanctification, when Amen. God sows his word, God, the word is preached to you, when you read your, the Bible, when you, you read the word, if there's not the spiritual dimension there, mm -hmm. the seed will never bring forth of its own kind. Mm. Yeah, that's what the parable of the sower, when Jesus spoke to us about him, you can sow it on the wayside, yeah, the birds take it. You sow it in, in, by the, the rocks, you know, the rocky way. There's no depth of soil. You know, so even if the rain comes, it doesn't bring forth. So, you know, the, the, you've got to get the conditions right if you want to get the right spiritual harvest inside of your life. Amen. Yeah. But don't be deceived. Because I've seen people, we've all been like that. You know, you've got sin inside of your life. You go in fellowship with people, the, the blessing, the anointing of God comes down. There's such a wonderful atmosphere there. All condemnation leaves your heart. You leave that place, you think everything's right, but you haven't made right with God. You, know, you still have iniquity inside of your life. Maybe you're still doing things wrong that you shouldn't be doing. But now, just because you got anointed now, you know, the, the anointing, the rain fell on you, don't forget it falls on the just and the unjust. That is not That's a right. determination that God is pleased with you just because his anointing falls upon you. That doesn't mean anything. You know, it's a personal decision to listen to the convicting power of the Holy Ghost, to confess your sins, to repent of your iniquities. That's something you have to do. God will quicken you to do it. But you know, that's why the anointing, we say, in a way, it can be deceiving if you don't understand that the rain falls on the just and the unjust. You will see somebody who lives in sin, they will pray for sick people and they will be healed. Exactly. You will find someone absolutely out of the will of God and they will be able to prophesy and that prophecy will absolutely come to pass. Exactly. And you'll look and say, but that man prophesied, he must be of God. No, let's wait and see the fruits. Let's wait and see the harvest now. That's how we know a tree is known by its fruits. Not by the rain that falls on the tree. The, the rain falls on the thorn bush just as much as it falls on the apple tree. That's right. Yeah, so it's not the rain. That's what I'm trying to just really get this point across in the beginning. When you speak it of the former rain, you know, when you speak it of God pouring out his spirit, God sending the rain in a certain season to achieve a certain purpose, so that the seed can germatize and start taking root. Make sure that your heart is right at that time. Make sure that you're sowing the right seed into your life at that time. Because if you sow the wrong seed in seed time, you're going to get the wrong harvest when it comes to the latter rain. Yeah, and that's what we see. That's why there's thousands of different denominations, Christian moves in that. that there's so many of them because a lot of different seed has been sown. You know, so you get a lot of different harvests coming forth, but I'm sure you're the same as me. We only have one chance at this in life. We only have one life to serve and to walk with the Lord. So we want to make sure that we do this scripturally. We do this the way God wants it to be done. That the seed that we sow is the original seed. Let's keep it the way that it was in the beginning, and you're going to get the same harvest that they received in the beginning as well. Amen. I, I think this principle is a very important one. So I wanted just to go via Samaria for a few minutes here. We're not going to be too long this evening. But to look at this one of the anointed ones in the end time. Now, this is one of the real mysteries we're speaking of now of our age. You know, this one, the anointed ones at the end time. Where do we get it from? Jesus, when he speaks of the conditions of the end in Matthew 24, you know, Matthew 24 is him speaking of, you know, they asked him, Master, what shall be the signs of your coming? What will be the signs of the end of the world? And then we know how he went through all the different things, be not deceived and all the different things. But when he gets right to the end, near the end of the chapter now, he says in verse 23, he gives us a warning. He says, then if any man shall say to you, lo, here is Christ or there, believe it not. 
Okay, now we need to understand that he's not saying that people will say, here is Jesus. That's not what he said. I mean, if somebody comes to you today and says, Jesus is in the church down the road, you know, there's a revival and Jesus is there, you'll never believe that. I mean, because you know that Jesus does not come back in a, his physical form until his feet touch the Mount of Olives. Yeah? Right at the end, when he comes down now, at the end, when Armageddon has set in and there's persecution against the Jews, then he comes physically now back to earth. So the coming we're looking for, we're not expecting Jesus to come and set his feet on earth. No. That's why it says, Paul says, we'll meet him in the air. We'll meet him in the clouds. That's the coming we're speaking about. So if somebody comes to you and says, yeah, I'm Jesus, that's not going to deceive anybody. I mean, you've got to really be very spiritually out of tune if you believe that you know, whoever it is. One of the big evangelists, whatever, is claiming is Jesus. In Australia, you know that he's false. But Jesus is saying that many will come and say, Lord, here is Christ. The word Christ means what? The word Christ means the anointed one. Christ means, Jesus Christ means Jesus, the anointed one. He's the anointed one. So when this now we'll start understanding now what Jesus is speaking about, about the deception that he warns us of in the end time, is there's going to be a lot of people rising up saying, I'm the anointed one. And many of them will be anointed. We can't deny that. But look at verse 24. What Jesus said to us in that one, he says, they'll say to us, Lo, here is Christ. Here's the anointed one. Or there. He says, believe it not. He said, be careful. For there shall arise false Christs. Not false Jesuses. But there shall arise false anointed ones. Excuse me. There's going to be Christ. There's going to be people that are anointed. You and I are Christians because we are anointed ones. We've been anointed. If you've received the baptism of the Holy Ghost, the Spirit of the Lord is upon you. You're an anointed one. So you are an amateur Christ in a way. Yeah? But there's going to arise false Christ, false anointed ones, people that are anointed with the genuine anointing, I'll prove it just now, but they are false. That's why I'm saying the rain falls on the just and the unjust. So just because the rain falls upon a person, the anointing falls upon a person, by no means means they are genuine. We need to go further to discern a little bit more. The Bible says discern the spirits. Try the spirits to see whether they be of God. So we, we, we mustn't be caught up that just because a meeting feels good, that everything that was said there was right. Just because people got out of their wheelchairs and walked doesn't mean what was preached there was the word of God. It doesn't mean that. And that is what Jesus is warning us of here. Beware. False Christ and false prophets. A New Testament prophet is an anointed minister. When somebody preaches and they say things supernaturally, you say things that could only be known supernaturally, that's the spirit of prophecy. And a New Testament prophet is a preacher. So somebody preaching under inspiration, speaking things supernaturally, yet being false. That's a serious thing to, to think about. False Christs, false prophets. It, it ties in well with the Apostle Paul when he tells that we can know all mysteries, we can move mountains with our faith, but if we do not have charity, if we do not have agape, the real love of God, and the love of God comes in us by the Holy Ghost, the Bible says, he says that prophets mean nothing. So we can do great things, friends, just with the anointing, but it doesn't mean our hearts are right doesn't mean that you're walking right with God or that the people are doing these things are walking right with God. Although the manifestations may be real, may be blessed, and we love and we desire those manifestations. We love it. We love to see the sick being healed. We love to see things supernaturally being revealed and made known. God speaking to his people and telling of things before they happen. It just happened in the last week. No, that we, the Lord did that in the lives of people that told me about those things and it helped us tremendously. So we appreciate those things. 
But we can't major on those things. We can't focus on those things because those things can mislead us. God has given us one thing we need to focus on, and that is his word. That's got to be the thing we focus on. And then everything else, as long as we've got the right seed being sown, when the anointing comes and we're sowing the right seed, we've got to get the right harvest. We know Amen. now we've got things the way that they should be. So he says that there'll be false Christ, false prophets, and they shall show great signs and wonders. In so much that if it were possible, they shall deceive the very elect. So this is not Islam, mm. you know, Muhammad being a false prophet. That's not what it's speaking. That's not going to deceive God's elect a speck. Now, this is not Jimmy Jones leading people astray in Guyana and saying he was Jesus. It's not that kind of thing. No, this is something that's close. These are anointed people doing great signs, great wonders. But if you're not, if your heart is not set upon the word, mm. you're not really born of the incorruptible seed of the word, you can be misled by these things. You can be deceived and led astray. That's what Jesus, and he warns us in verse 25, mm. behold, I have told you before. He says, I've warned you. He says, don't come later on and say to me, but Lord, this happened. He says, I warned you. I told you what to look out for. You should have heeded my warning. You should have paid attention to what I said. You know, so we want to really take this thing. That's why I wanted to just go into this one a little bit. When you're speaking of the rain, the former and the latter, and blessed things, when the Holy Ghost is poured out from heaven in certain seasons of time. Friends, we love the anointing. We love to be in the Spirit. I hate being even one day, not getting into the anointing, not getting into the presence of God. You want to walk in the Spirit. You want to sing in the Spirit, Paul said. You want to pray in the Spirit. We want to live in the Spirit, yes. But friends, let's make sure that we don't substitute that for the real sincerity, the real sacred, sincere walk with God inside of our hearts. Those two things have got to go together. Don't just depend upon the anointing because we can be deceived. Okay, now let's just prove this point a little bit here. Acts chapter 1, verse 16, speaking of Judas, this is the disciples. They wanted to choose somebody to replace Judas. Judas says, hung himself. And then the rope must have broken. He fell down headlong. We know the Bible says, and you know what happened to him. And now the disciples wanted to choose someone to replace Judas. And look what they say about Judas. Men and brethren, this scripture must needs have been fulfilled, which the Holy Ghost by the mouth of David spake before concerning Judas, which was guide to them that took Jesus. For he was numbered with us and had obtained part of this ministry. That's right. Judas had exactly the same ministry as Peter. Judas had exactly the same ministry as James and John. Jesus had given them power over all the power of the enemy. He told them, go and raise the dead. Go and heal the sick. Go and preach the gospel. Go and tell people, behold, the kingdom of God is upon you. And they all went, the 12, the Bible says, including Judas, went forth and came back rejoicing because the devils were subject unto them. Mm. You know, so it proves to us, but what was in his heart? He still loved the world. Until he sold Jesus out for 30 pieces of silver. That's how much he valued Jesus. And the Bible says that he died and went to his place. I don't have the scripture, but in verse 25 of Acts chapter 1, it says, you know, we need to choose somebody that he may take part of this ministry and apostleship from which Judas by transgression fell. So Judas had a ministry, an apostleship. That's the highest calling in the fivefold ministry, the ministry of an apostle. Mm. And a, an apostle has great signs and wonders that follow their ministry. I mean, it's, it's a high call. We'd call them missionaries now. You know, they go out to virgin territory and they, the Lord uses them. And, you know, God shows himself alive in places where Christ hasn't been preached. And then people repent and they set things in order. Then they appoint pastors and they move on to the next place. There are people that go and set things in order. They're greatly used of God. 
And Judas was an apostle of the Lord Jesus Christ. He was just as anointed, had just as much power and authority as the rest of the disciples. That's but true. He was a devil in his heart, the Bible says. You know, so friends, in this age of tele-evangelism, where there's great claims and great things, be careful. Not saying that many of those people are not anointed. Many of them are. But Jesus said you will know them by their fruits. Amen. We'll get on to that a bit more just now. Now, this is the one. Revelation 2, verse 14. So Jesus now, speaking to the church ages, he says, Behold, he says, But I have a few things against thee, because thou hast them there which hold the doctrine of Balaam, who taught Balak to cast a stumbling block before the children of Israel. Now, to those who don't know the Bible so well, excuse me, Balaam in Numbers chapter 22, chapter 23, 24, Balaam was a prophet that when Israel was coming out in the Exodus move under the prophet Moses, were coming out of Egypt, they were in the wilderness, just about to come into the promised land. The king of Moab, we were with Brother Maxwell when he went to the Dead Sea. We looked across the Dead Sea and I told the brothers, there's the mountains of Moab. Moab is just the other side of the Dead Sea. Amen. It bordered onto Israel. So Israel was right near the promised land. And the king of, of, of Moab called Balak, he knew how these people, this Exodus people under the, the, the leadership of God, you know how they had just how what had happened in Egypt and what had happened to people that withstood them. So he was scared. And so there was another prophet in that day called Balaam. And he wasn't a false prophet. He was a prophet. Mm -hmm. And Balaam called him and said, please come and curse this people for me. And Balaam came. You can read it. Numbers chapter 21, 22, 23, 24. Balaam now goes and asks the Lord and yeah, yeah, yeah. He prepares his, his altars and he makes his sacrifice. He knows how to approach Jehovah. Mm -hmm. He knows how to approach God. And the anointing comes down now. The anointing of prophecy comes upon the prophet. And the Lord says to him, don't go with these people because, with Balak, because these that are coming are my people. Amen. And Balaam goes and tells him, he says, look, please, I can't come with you because God has forbidden me to come. And so they go back now, these messengers, to King Balak, and they say, Balaam said he can't come. And so he says, please, I need him to come. Take more silver, take more gold. Tell him I'll promote him to greater honor. And they come back to Balaam, and Balaam now, he looks at the riches, and he looks at the money, and he looks at what he can make now. Showing this man's heart was not right before God. Mm -hmm. What does Balaam do? He goes a second time to the Lord. Now, when you go to God a second time, God is going to answer you according to his permissive will. It's not going to be his perfect will. He's going to give you a permissive will. That is not God's perfect will. He said to Balaam, okay, go. And Balaam went, and we know that he was almost smitten on the way, and how the donkey crushed his foot against the wall, and the donkey spoke to him and stuff. But finally, Balaam gets to the place. He goes and looks, gets to a place on the mountain. He's looking down over Israel. He makes his sacrifice. He knows how to approach God again. The anointing comes down and he breaks into the vision. He breaks into the spirit, Balaam, and he blesses Israel. And he can't curse them. And then Balaam says, no, you weren't supposed to bless them. <laughs> and Balaam says, but I can't curse who God has blessed. And Balaam gets so in the spirit, he prophesies of a star rising out of Jacob. He prophesies of the coming of Christ. Amen. He prophesies about the, the scepter and all different things. And those prophecies of Balaam are scripture. They're mm. in the Bible. It was purely God breathed his word through Balaam, and that was recorded. That's God's word. But the man's heart wasn't right. Now, the Bible doesn't fill us in very much. But the next thing we find, the children of Israel, they invited now by Moab to come to a feast. Come, let's dance together. Let's eat together. You know, wah, wah, wah. And they fall into sin, and God has to smite the children of Israel because of Baal Peor, it's called. You know, the sin of Baal Peor. And so now, John in the Spirit, the Lord reveals him what actually happened. Balaam knew 
I cannot prophesy against these people. But he went, because his heart was set upon the riches, he went and he taught Balak. He went and gave him teaching now, told him what to do, said, I know how to ensnare these people. Invite them to a feast. Let your women strip themselves down, entice them. Let's say we worship the same God. And Israel fell because of the teaching of Balaam. Mm. You see how this confirms what we're saying? His anointing, the rain was genuine. It was a genuine mm. anointing. But the seed that he sowed, his seed was false doctrine, false seed that he sowed. And that led now to, when the harvest came, now innocent people perished. Well, not only innocent people, but children of Israel perished in their iniquities because of the teaching of Balaam. So that's what I'm saying. When the former rain is falling, when the rain is falling, when the Holy Ghost is there, We've got to be so careful, the seed that we sow with them. Amen, amen. Because amen. whatsoever a man sows, that shall he reap. If you sow the seed of prosperity, if you tell people, God wants you all to be a millionaire, you know, like people are preaching now, just send your money to me. Make your check payable to me. Yeah? And if you give me a thousand, God will give you a hundredfold, my friend. That's the teaching of Balaam. Mm -hmm. Not just say those people aren't anointed. Anointed, they can pray. People come out of their wheelchairs. You no, know, they pray, and you know, sick people throw away their crutches. That's where it comes in false Christs. People that are anointed, but their teaching is false. The anointing is genuine, but the teaching is false. Friends, this is one of the most important. I came from the charismatic church. I know about the anointing. I know what it is to speak in tongues. I know what it is for there to be prophecy inside of your life. I, when I first became a Christian in the charismatic church, I had prophecy given over my life in a cell group meeting by someone of the gift of prophecy that absolutely has come to pass in my life. Hmm. And yet that person later backslid and is no longer a Christian. You know, but the anointing, friends, the anointing is genuine. But it's the, what follows after. A tree is known by their fruits. And that's why the teaching of your church, the teaching in your life is so, so important because Amen. be yeah. not deceived. We saw that. Let's just skip back to that one. God is not by whatever a man sows, that shall he reap. If someone's going to sow carnal seed, if somebody's going to sow emotional seed, if somebody's going to sow, sow you know, all manner of other things, that's the harvest you're going to get inside of your life. Because the anointing comes to prepare the conditions for the seed to germatize. But be careful what seed you sow into that condition. You, know, you make a mistake by the wrong seed down at the, the wholesaler. You go to your field. The, the spring rains, the, the autumn rains have come. The former rain has prepared the ground. You plow your ground. The conditions are right. There's fertility. You sow the seed in your sincerity. It's not sincerity that does the job. Mm. If you sincerely sow the wrong seed, you still are going to reap the wrong harvest. It's got to be the genuine original seed. And Amen. God's spoken word, his word is the original seed. Amen. And Paul said, if any man preaches anything different, even if an angel from heaven, Paul said, even if I come and preach you something different, then what I've preached to you, even if an angel, he says, let it be, let it be cursed, Paul said. You know, so that's why I just wanted to stress on that one a little bit, because we're living in an age where there's such an emphasis on the anointing. And there must be. Without the anointing, we can do nothing. But friends, we've got to balance it up now. It's the seed time, the seed and the anointing. We've got to balance these things. Otherwise, Satan can come in. Jesus says, no, I've told you before, be careful. Beware of these false Christs. Beware of these false prophets. You'll say, but give me another example. No problem. Let's look at John chapter 11. This is near the end of Jesus' ministry. This is actually the time of the latter reign in Jesus' ministry. So many things were being fulfilled at this time. So many prophecies were being fulfilled. He's about to be crucified. He's going to fulfill the hundreds of scriptures now, shadows and types. And because the rain is falling at that time to quicken Jesus, yeah, 
He's the seed that had to be sown, that to quicken the word, to fulfill the word. That same rain falls also on the unjust. It falls on Caiaphas, the high priest. And it says in one of them named Caiaphas, the people were saying, this man, Jesus, everybody is following him. And one of them named Caiaphas, being the high priest that same year, said unto them, you know nothing at all. No consider. That is an expedient for us, that one man should die for the people and that the nation perish not. Now listen to what it says. And this he spake, not of himself. He didn't say that for himself. But being the high priest, that year he prophesied that Jesus should die for that nation. You know, what a principle that that is. This man, Caiaphas, the Holy Ghost, fell upon the man. He prophesied that Jesus would die for the nation. And yet we find him condemning Jesus and putting him to death just a couple of chapters later. So it shows that, friends, the most important thing is a repentant heart, a righteous heart, for the Lord to deal with your heart, to set things right inside of you. And then when the anointing comes, now you can take advantage of that anointing because you've got the right seed inside. You've got the right conditions. Your heart is right. Sowing the right seed, you're going to come to the right harvest. Let's just skip through a couple more slides and then we'll bring it just to a discussion. We don't want to take too long. <clears throat> if I can get my slides to work. Okay, let's give a few examples here. Now, the former and the latter, and then we'll finish off and pick it up again next time. We've got to put Joseph in here. So we're speaking of the former rain being the rain which starts the germination, starts things off. It's the seed time. And then the latter rain is the harvest rain now, which comes to quicken things so they come to maturity, they come to harvest because that's the end result of why you're sowing the seed. You want it to bring forth the harvest. You want that seed to bring forth of its own kind. So Joseph had his former reign. Here came the Holy Ghost. It visited Joseph privately in his youth. And here he sees the dreams. He sees himself with his sheaf of wheat. He sees the sun and the moon and the 11 stars bowing down to him. And a sign, you know, that something spiritual took place in his life during the time of his former reign was his father gave him the coat of many colors, which types the Holy Ghost. You know, so he received the anointing. He received the Holy Ghost in his youth. God was dealing with him in a spiritual way. And the seed was being sown. God sowed the genuine seed, the promise of what was going to take place inside of his life. And that germatized. It took root in the heart of Joseph, and it started to grow. And now the seed had to go through a season now, through the hot season of summer. He had to go through his trials and all of that. But then it gets to the end now. It comes now to the time for Joseph to manifest the seed that he is, the purpose that God has for his life. And there comes another season. He's in the prison, and he has the butler and the baker, and they dream. And here comes this real anointing upon Joseph, and he anoints their dreams. Things happen quickly. He's taken out of the prison. He's taken before Pharaoh. He interprets Pharaoh's dreams. Now, there's a quickening here to bring him into his position. And then everything opens up, and now he's given a robe of fine linen, the second robe of the kingdom now. Yeah, and you can see that in the life of Joseph. You know, so... You can see something spiritual took place to start the work in the days of his youth. It was a seed time. It was a former reign. It was spiritual. It wasn't just intellectual. It wasn't just people telling him things. There was a spiritual something took place. Mm -hmm. And in order for him to come now to his position, to the harvest time in his life, he needed now the quickening to come, to quicken him to the right hand of Pharaoh. So we're going to find this in anybody you look when God deals with them. And that's, I wanted to bring it to close off on this so you can look inside of your experience to make sure that in your formative years, don't just accept, as we always said, intellectual understanding of things. If God is dealing with you, he will anoint you or send anointing, the former reign inside of your life. 
And he says, ask of me rain in the time of the former rain, in the time of the latter rain. In that season, seek the Lord until you find him. Sow the right seed, get in the word, feed on the incorruptible seed of the word at that time in Sarah. Yeah, yeah. Let the Lord speak to you and deal with you in the days of your youth. That's going to set you up for your harvest, friends. That's going to set you up. Now, David as well. Here's David being anointed by the prophet Samuel in the days of his youth. Now we know David had his seed time. Here came the anointing upon him. The Bible says the Holy Ghost came upon him. Here's David looking after the sheep. It's all private. It's all his inside life. It's his hidden life. God dealing personally with David. But he anoints him. And here comes the seed being sown into his life. You shall be king. God has sent me to find a man after his own heart. So here's the seed of promise being sown. Here's the anointing. That seed takes root inside of David. And he receives this anointing. And the anointing never leaves him. It never leaves you from your seed time. All the way through the seasons, you need the showers of blessing to keep the crop growing up to maturity. Because you're going to go through trials now. You're going to go through tests. You're going to go through temptations. You're going to go through disappointments. If there's not a spiritual something that takes place in your seed time, if there's not something that quickens that word of promise to you, and so that it takes root in your experience and starts to grow under your former reign, when the persecution comes, Jesus says that seed sowed by the wayside. It's like the seed that starts to grow. Then the persecution comes and it dies. You know, you want the seed of promise of Christ to be embedded in your soul, embedded in your heart, to take root and to start to grow. And then you water that experience with worship, with praise. And then you go through your testing time, your seasons of growth. Until finally, you come to your adoption. We were speaking of last year. You come to your position that God wanted you to be. So David now is 17 years old. He's anointed by Samuel the prophet. It's a private ceremony, just his family being there. Yeah, maybe whoever else was there. But then, at the age of 30, here comes the prophet now to anoint him king over Israel in Hebron. That's what the second picture is. This is now his public coronation. He is now quickened, the final quickening to his position on the throne. You know, so you need both of these seasons inside your life. You know, you need God to really visit you in the days of your youth, to establish you, to set certain spiritual principles in motion inside of your life, like they did with David. That set, that visitation of Samuel, that anointing of oil, the Holy Ghost coming upon him, it set certain spiritual principles in operation inside of his life that if he just continued walking in that channel now, he was going to come to the promise. Absolutely. Because God cannot lie. And that is why we see there's the former rain and there's the latter rain. And now you can take so many examples in the Bible. I almost this evening came, because you've been looking at Samson during our morning manners in the morning, I almost came this evening to speak about Samson's latter reign. You know, but I didn't, I thought maybe we'll do it another time. But Samson had his latter reign as well. His once more Lord, and then the super anointing came upon him at the time of the collapse, as the, the temple collapsed of Dagon. Yet he'd had his former reign. You know, he had had his his jawbone of a mule. He had had his gates of Gaza. You know, he had had God really working inside of his life to, to, to establish him, to confirm the commission inside of his life. But then he got tried and tested and purified in the prison house. And then finally now there was a once more Lord. And here was the vessel prepared now. His heart was purged now, fully set upon his commission. And here came the latter rain upon Samson. And it was more glorious than all the work he'd done all his life. More that he killed in his death than all the days of his life. You know, so I don't think we'll take it much further. I'll just skip through one more slide. But you can see this principle, saints. It's very important. And we'll take it next time to show what happened at Pentecost. 
They had to be the former rain in the church ages. That to be a mighty outpouring so that the seed could germinate, the seed could take root. And then the church has gone through the various ages, but there's got to come in the latter rain. There's got to come a final quickening to bring about the final harvest, which is the rapture. There's got to be the final quickening so that the seed from all through the ages is gathered together. The dead in Christ shall rise, and we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them to meet him in the clouds. You know, so there's got to come something to quicken our mortal bodies. Got to come something to fulfill the scriptures in our season that some of, many of us shall not see death. And that's the promise of the word. But we shall be changed in the moment in the quick twinkle of an eye. Maybe we'll look at it next time, but yeah, I think maybe we'll get on to Hannah next time. We'll speak about this one here, the spiritual principle, because speaking of David being anointed there on the right hand side, maybe I'll just finish with this, just for five minutes. But let's not forget, when the prophet Samuel came and anointed David, David wasn't the only one anointed. There was also Saul anointed in that age. It was the age between the judges and the kingdom now, Samuel rose up. That's why I put Hannah. You know, there was an anointing. There was a visitation. There had to come something, a former reign, so that Hannah could conceive, so that the seed could germinate to bring forth the spirit of prophecy to finish the years of the judges, which types the church ages. Amen. When every man now has been doing what's right in his own eyes, that's why there's so many different denominations. That's the end of the book of Judges. There were a lot of anointed people, judges in the book of Judges, but they needed something to come forth to bring forth the kingdom of David. Just as much as at the end of the church ages, there's got to be something come forth to bring forth the kingdom of the son of David. And then Solomon came, established the temple, the prince of peace, Shalom, Solomon. He types Christ in the millennium. You know, so this season where Hannah was is our season in time. It's at the end of the church ages, the time of the judges. Just as the kingdom age is being ushered in, the anointing is going to come first about Saul. So you can see David wasn't the first one to be anointed. Yeah. I will get into it next week to show that when the Holy yeah. Ghost fell in the end time, the first place it fell was at Azusa Street. Amen. Amen. You see, it didn't first fall... The spirit of prophecy, when it was born again in our age, didn't first fall on the bride. Didn't first fall on David. It fell on Saul. My, my. You see, we'll get into it more to show how that's a type of our age. Wow. That's why he has Saul on the left-hand side also being anointed by Samuel. The same spirit of prophecy that was born through Hannah's intercession anoints two different vessels, both with the same anointing. So we're going to find there's going to be the charismatic move, very anointed, signs and wonders and gifts are restored to the church. Then there's going to be another move come up later on. And one of them is going to finish up on the throne. Only David, because Saul, though he's made king for a season, but he's rejected in the end. God rejects him. Faith says, I was going to establish your house. I was going to establish your kingdom. But because of his disobedience, because of his rebellion, because he couldn't walk, when Samuel the prophet came and told him what to do, go and smite Agag. Don't leave anybody alive. He didn't listen. And then God gave him two chances, came again, and, and Samuel said, Go and wait for me seven days in Gilgal. I think it was. Where was it? I can't remember where it was. Seven days. And then Samuel delayed to come. And then Saul, he makes an offering. He breaks the order. He offers a burnt offering himself being a king. And then God rejected him now and says, no. This man, yes, he's anointed. This man, he did mighty exploits. And even after David now was in the wilderness, Saul still did exploits. We're not saying that people in these moves don't do great exploits, friends. They do. Type by Saul. You listen to the message, rejected king. The prophet explains exactly what I'm saying here. But then there had to be something raised up in the end to usher in the kingdom of Solomon, to usher in the millennium. You see, and that's when God now came and anointed 
a man after his, his own heart, the most unlikely of candidates. No one ever would have thought that he was the one that was chosen to be anointed with this final quickening that quickened in the kingdom so that the temple could be built and the glory could come into the temple. Amen. Amen. You know, so it's exactly how it will. We'll get into a little bit more next time, but it's just to show this principle to tie it in with our anointed ones at the end time. In the, this age, at the end of Judges, coming into the kingdom age, it wasn't only David that was anointed. And if you wanted to know who was really walking with God, who was walking in line with what Samuel said, with the word? For, who was obedient to that word? Who was bringing forth the fruits of that word? But both of them had the same anointing upon them. So. Amen. I think it might be sufficient to finish off. I'll just come down to the last slide to say, does anybody have any questions there? Anything yeah. I would like to question or ask about that? Brother Andrew? Yes, Brother Jess. Um, do you know, um, I just have a question about the, the scripture. Um, I have two questions, actually. For Gal yeah. Galatians 6 to 7. Absolutely. Where it counts not marked. And like my first question is, is it possible to sow a seed of like sacrifice to God, like on the altar? And if it is, does that, does that like fall in line with like God is not mocked, whatever you sow? You, yeah, that... you, yes, but yes, you're absolutely right. And it, but it just depends when we define what is it that we're supposed to sow on the altar? Like we said the other week when you spoke about it, it's the altar of your heart. And Paul says, we should offer ourselves as a living sacrifice. sacrifice. That's the acceptable offering to the Lord. You know, so Amen. you're taking your, your, your ambitions, you're taking your reputation, you're taking everything and say, Lord, your will be done. You know, it's laying yourself, your all on the altar to say, Lord, now, don't get me wrong, Brad Jess, it doesn't mean you'll be perfect outwardly. But David, he made his mistakes. You go and look at David. Now, you go and read his life. He wasn't a perfect man. He got caught in things and he did this and he did that. But the Bible says he was a man after God's own heart. In his heart, he, the most important thing to him was to glorify the Lord, was that, to do the will of God. That was the most important thing to David. Though he was a man with mistakes like you and I. But you can tell that David, he was willing to lay aside anything. He would sacrifice anything if the Lord told him. Amen. And if you're in that condition, you're going to go far with God. You know, if you can, at, like with Abraham, when he says, go and offer your son. You know, when that precious thing, compared to the rich young ruler, when he was told, just take your riches, give them to the poor, come and follow me. He couldn't overcome himself and put that on the altar. It was too important for him. That was too much. That was his God. That was what he really worshipped ahead of God. That was the most important thing to him. So, you know, what God is looking for, we sing it, a humble heart. Now, contrite yes. heart. Amen. A contrite spirit. That's what Amen. God wants. He wants a heart, a heart that is tender to his word. That's what it says in the prophets. I can't remember which prophet said in the Old Testament. That, that when God speaks and you hear God's word, you don't answer back against it. You don't read yeah. against it. Now, you don't try to find some way that you don't have to do it, like Saul did. You, know, you find some excuse why I don't have to apply that. No, but you, you're not interested. You say, but Lord, if you're asking me to do it, if my attitude is right, you'll give me the grace to do it. Yes, sir. So the real altar is your Cain came and offered on the altar, but God didn't accept it. So the offering sometimes isn't the important thing. It's the condition of the heart that offers it. Here comes a widow with two mites. She offers it in the temple, two pennies. Here's all the rich men putting bags of gold in the building fund. Jesus calls his disciples, come and see this. Do you see this widow woman? It was so small what she was given, but it's all that she had. You know, so God looked on the heart. That moved God. That moved him. And Jesus called his disciples and said, look at this woman. She's willing to give all that she has. And that's why the woman of the alabaster box take it. That was, that was a year's worth of money. 
Let's say you earn 30,000 euro a year. That was worth 30,000. She took it and she got an anointing. Got it. She broke it. That was all of her money. And she poured it out as an offering to the Lord. And that's why Jesus, wherever, wherever this gospel is preached, this shall be spoken of as a memorial. Amen. Because she did this anointing with my burial. So, you know, the important thing, Brother Jesse, in all these things, like I've said, is not the gift. It's not the anointing. Those things are wonderful and good, but it's your heart. It is your heart right with God? Have you laid everything on the altar? And if you, can, if you have a heart that's soft before the Lord, my friend, God is going to move heaven and earth to help you when you need help. God is going to send a word in season when you low in spirit. God is going to send showers of blessing when you need your seasons of refreshing. Yeah, because he sees your heart. Does that answer what you, what you want to deliver? You know, it's really the heart is the most. That's how we quoted the other day what you know, Proverbs, my son, give me your heart. That's what David was saying to Solomon. You know, God is asking for your heart. That's the most. Then from the inside, everything else will work out from there. But even Pastor, before Brad, Jesse asks his other question. Yeah. Um, I like that principle about the heart. Because you can actually see everyone in their Christian life where they began. Yeah. Brother Max, yourself, everyone. You can see there's people you began with. And then they later manifested what was in their heart. Yes. Although those people you began with look so sincere. They, hey, you know, like they make you feel ashamed, you know. Absolutely. And then later when you look at their lives and see their fruits, and you think to yourself, hey, it's hard to believe that this person, he looked like he, he was, you know, like how uh, Tony Reagan says, in America, they like the big presidents, you know, like Saul, the massive people. They look like the most successful people. But, you know, when you see their fruits later in life, you know, you can really see what was in the heart. And to me, I really love that because it's important in my life that my heart is always right. If you listen to that message, Rejected King, which is the prophet preached. I mean, it's such a nice message because he shows how Saul was head and shoulders above the rest. I mean, he was, you know, everyone else only up to his shoulders. So outwardly, when Israel wanted a king, God said, Samuel told them, no, you don't need a king. They looked at the other nations, Israel. They wanted yeah. man to lead them. That's the worst thing you can ever do is be under man. It doesn't mean you mustn't be under headship, but it's got to be the headship of God in man, not just man. Amen. When you're under the headship of man, like if you're in a denomination and the, before the minister can preach, he's got to get permission from the you know, headquarters to preach something. You know, like say, if you're in the Roman Catholic Church, you know, the priest preached the same thing the whole world around on a Sunday. It's not leadership of God. God is not leading his people. God cannot feed his people because man is blocking the way. That's why God never wanted man to be over man. God wanted to be their king. That's what he says. Amen. That's why Samuel told them, no, you don't need a king like the other nations. God is your king and he rules and he speaks to his prophet. But they said, no, we want a king. So God said, give them permissive will. They'll pay for it. But go and tell them when they get the king, he's going to tax them, take their daughters to bake his bread, take your sons into the army, take 20% of your crops. And you're going to cry out one day and say, we shouldn't have had a king. The people says, no, we want a king like the other nations. That's when God said, okay, Samuel, go and anoint Saul. <laughs> and Saul came and he was anointed. Now he's king. But he wasn't a man after God's own heart. You see, he could never fully walk in God's will. He was never fully obedient. But he was a big man. He looked like the real thing. But God says, I don't look at people the way that man looks at people. Amen. I look on the heart. Yeah, and that's Hallelujah. the use your heart. Yeah, you but should I come in here? Sorry, yes, please, brother. Should yeah, I come in here also? Please, bro. Yeah, um, what actually I see about uh, our brother Jesse is that he has a, a real true heart. Absolutely. But um, it looks as if he puts himself down and judges himself uh, too much. He stretches himself that probably he's not doing enough. <laughs> you see? So that's the way how Hallelujah. I feel. Yes. 
he is not others uh, uh, are satisfied with what he is doing. But the whole thing is that, Brother Jesse, I mean, I see that you have the right spirit. I mean, we really want to worship God. So just don't judge yourself so much. Just keep calm. Let God just do his work in you. Amen. Amen. Don't look at people, how far they are going and you are not catching up. No. God has his own space, space for you. So just remain that way and move on smoothly. You see? So that's the advice that I will give to my young brother. That's very good, Brian Max. And that's a very, very true advice. Is that you know, even this morning when I was listening, I don't know if I said it in the morning, matter, but when Joshua, how he was encouraged by Moses, when the Lord said, Joshua, as I was with Moses, so I'll be with, with you. Amen. And the prophet shows, Joshua was so encouraged by that because Moses had let God down. Yet God never forsook Moses. Moses went 40 years out of the will of God to the backside of the desert. Moses threw the stones down in his temper. Moses, he did a lot of things, Moses. But you know, he was overcome sometimes by the outward man. But God never went looking for another prophet. God Amen. said, I have my man, Moses. When I need him, I know where to put my hand upon him. You know, so that encouraged Joshua to say, but Lord, you saying you'll stick with me like you did with Moses, even in his bad days, even in the days when he, he let you down, days when he didn't feel like worshiping, you never changed your mind about him. And Brother Jesse, God will never change his mind about you. Amen. You know, I mean, before the foundation of the world, he wrote your name in his book. Yeah. The Bible says as many as he has called, he has justified. As many as he has justified, he has already in his mind glorified. And he who began the good work in you will be faithful to complete it. So like Brother Max is saying, rest in that. You know, if God needs something to change in your life, he'll speak to you, he'll deal with you. Yeah, yeah, and, and, he, and he knows how to do it the best way. John, so, question there, Brother, brother Jess? Sorry, Pastor. I want yeah, uh, Jeff Kate. Yeah, uh, just uh, the thing you say now about justification, because I was, uh, I wonder myself as well, when Abana spoke about in the message, spoken word is the original seed. Yeah. I spoke about David. I want to know exactly before the foundation, the, the foundation of the world, God Himself, He put that seed in us, which yeah. is the world. Because He said, David, if he did some mistake, because he was he, he was expecting to get the rain, and yeah. the Bible said the rain will receive is by by the Holy Ghost with Jesus after Jesus Christ. So, absolutely, absolutely, yeah. brother. absolutely. So, and it, it, yeah. it, it even comes down, brother, what, to, to, to back up what you're saying was about Jacob. Why Jacob so much desired the birthright? Because it was the seed in him like, okay. mm -hmm. to desire the birthright. Esau despised the birthright. I mean, uh, Jacob, Esau despised the birthright, but Jacob just had a hunger and a thirst. Yet outwardly, Esau was the better brother. He looked after his parents better. You know, he was, until his father wanted him to be, wanted to give the, the blessing to, to Esau. But God looked in his heart. And like you're saying, brother, Jesus, what he comes down is the seed that God has placed inside of you. My sheep hear my voice. You know, it's, it's a, just respond to that. You visit that seed. Just, just respond to it. Thanks, brother. It was very good on there, brother JFK. Appreciate it, bro. I think the other thing as well, Pastor, which we must remember, I remember when we were young Christians and we used to sit at your guys' feet, you know? The thing is, we must enjoy the journey. Amen. If I'm trying to be like Pastor Andrew, uh, it's going to be hard. Don't, don't try. <laughs> no, I'll tell you. It's myself hard enough the... being me myself. <laughs> you see, rather stick to my corner, enjoy my journey, because it, it, and the prophet says a lot of depth in that when he says, don't try to take Johnny's corner. Yeah. Just, just, even if, if you're not sure where you meant to be, just, Mama, just be a Christian. You know, the, the believer's place, the prophet says, is what? It's a rest. Mm. It's just a rest in the Lord. Amen. And then those things will come forth, you know, seek ye first the kingdom, and those things will follow after. Amen. Amen. Amen.
It's like, by George, even that one where he gives the counsel when those, uh, the, the, those men come to him and say, we just received the Holy Ghost. Should we receive, should we seek for gifts now in our experience? Mm-hmm. It says, by no means. He says, if God has something for you, he knows how to bring it to you. Amen. You just serve God day by day. And what God had, like David, like Joseph, God knows how to bring it to you. He knows how to get you there. He, he might take you an unexpected way. You know, he might take you through this, through that. But he knows how to prepare you. The footsteps of the righteous are ordered by the Lord, even when you don't understand where he's leading you. He knows the way that he's leading you. Because you have to see that. That, that. That's the key. Hello, Pastor. Sister Anne want to say something. Sister Anne, please, sister. Yeah. I don't know if I can explain it or not, but you know that scripture that says the heart is more deceitful um, who can know it? Yes. Can you explain that? It was just in relation when you were talking about Cain's sacrifice and Abel's sacrifice. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That scripture came to me. You know, how do you, I'm not saying that you don't know that your heart's right, but yeah. can you be deceived that maybe you're, you know. Yes. Absolutely. When it speaks of the, the heart being deceitful, two things. Firstly, before we were born again, we absolutely were deceived by our own heart. Yeah? But even once you're born again, there's a portion of us, the heart is also the seat of your emotions. It's also got a part of your reasoning, your understanding. If you go by your feelings, you can be really misled many times. That's where it can be very, very deceiving. Something may feel right. Like when Sarah said to Abraham, why don't you take Hagar? I mean, she was beautiful. It seemed like a good idea. You know, it was a pleasant thing he was being asked to do. But it wasn't God's will. You know, so Sarah got to the stage, instead of resting in the promise, she, she lent on her own understanding. She thought about it too much in her own humanistic way. She made her own plan. She thought, okay, let me help God. Let me do this. Let me do that. You know? yeah. And I think that's the key. We don't need to help God. Amen. Amen. We don't need to try to help God to get his will done in our lives. We need to yield to him. That's why, like Brother George was saying, to rest in Christ. The key, if you listen to the message, why are people so tossed about? The key to the whole Christian life, he says, is yielding. Striving is very different than yielding. The striving means you're fighting to, to get things done. No, to yield means the Lord comes to and says, let's do this. And you yield and you follow him now and things get done. You're working in a commission, a co-mission in partnership with him. You know? So your heart, yes, when you're not leading on the mind of Christ, but instead it's your understanding. It's your feelings. It's your reasoning. Every one of us, we make those mistakes. We're still subject to that. I mean, the prophet himself wanted to go and live in Alaska. You know, he wanted to say, I'm tired of people criticizing me. Let me go and live in Alaska. You know, it's quite, a, quite an easy thing to do. Satan gets you to a certain place. And then you can, the prophet actually speaks of it as deceived thinking. You know, that's more that realm. You're deceived in your thinking. But a born again heart, sister, you can never really be deceived within the soul, you know, within the, the heart now. No, that's the control tower. But when you let your thoughts and your reasoning overpower that inside voice, that's why sometimes we need to be still. We need to get quiet and wait on the Lord so he can speak from within the veil. And then that never fails. That's faith now. That never fails. When he speaks from there, all other voices go silent. But sometimes that's the greatest battle because all these other voices are speaking to us and we start paying attention to them instead of listening to that voice within. Thank you. Pastor, maybe me. Yes. Uh, God bless you. Uh, what the prophet said in the message, we will find about the former rain and the latter rain. We will, what we have at the end, we will find in Genesis everything. So when you see two seeds, when you see two seeds, they receive in mother life of the one creator. Yeah like uh, uh, former rain, but at the end, you see how they react. One was uh, laid down like Abel, his life on the altar, Absolutely. according to Revelation, and Cain went on the other side, but all the way 
of life, they live from the same life. So even, even today, we have many people say, we, our father uh, is uh, God, or we believe in Christ and Jesus, but yeah. because, just because we live from the same life, what is coming from, from God, from, this, from the same reign today. Yeah. That's true, brother. And, and I think it, it really comes, like you're saying, take everything back to the beginning. Both yeah. Cain and Abel offered, they made the same kind of altar. You know, they, you know, they approached God the same way, but there was a difference inside of them. I yeah, think, yeah, yeah. brother Sasha, next week when we get in, because there's always the three kinds of believers. You know, if you go back to Genesis, then you'll get the serpent seed and you'll get the seed of, of Adam. But when we get into it, you need to, like, there's Abraham, there's Lot, and there's the people in Sodom. So it's the one in the middle. Mm -hmm. you know, Lot also was, well, you know, Lot also had a righteous heart. Lot also, he, you know, God cared for him in a measure. I think it's that group there we need to focus on one day because it's not just always the two, there's the three. Mm -hmm. yes. you know, so so you'll, you'll find that, even, that's like I'm saying, there's King Saul, there's you know, David, you'll find at the same time, and then there's the unbelievers, there's the Moabites and all those. So you'll always find those three groups. There's the perfect will of God, there's being the permissive will of God, and then there's being out of the will of God. There's yeah. always those three things. You know? So we'll, we'll find those things as we go. But thanks, but it's very good. Okay, thanks. Sorry, Pastor. I have a question as well. Sorry. Yeah. Um, so, you know, when you say you will know by its fruits or their fruits, what, yeah. what do you mean? Is it the characteristic, character of the person or people that follow the doctrine? Very good like question. How? Well, if, if, if you want to listen to something, listen to the message called discernment of spirit. Maybe you listened already. But inside of that message, the prophet speaks about, he takes that scripture which says, try the spirits to see whether they be of God. The prophet says, we, are, we have no authority. We're not commanded by scripture to judge any person, yeah, individually. You shouldn't judge a person. That's right. But the Bible says we should try the spirit. We should judge the spirit in a person. And then he says, we're not judging the, a spirit on a person. Because a person might have a genuine anointing, it might be generous, but it's the spirit in a person. What is a person's spirit? Is their aim, their objective, their motive. What are they trying to achieve? That's what we are told in the Bible to try the spirits, to see whether they be of God. So if a man comes, he gives an example, a man comes in the city, does great things, you know, the, the sick are healed, and you have people, and then he wants to make himself the big man, yeah, and everybody else out of the picture. Now, if you want to go in the rapture, you have to follow me. I've got the anointing for the rapture. We've seen it in the message, sister, for years and years and years. It's been the plague and the curse, not just in the Christian world, but in the message. You know, where a man is anointed, he's got a genuine anointing, but his spirit isn't right. His motive, his aim, his objective isn't. That's the fruits now, you'll see the fruits from that. So uh, bringing it down to that. He says, but if you find someone who comes and he, he, you know, he, God uses a person and he's trying to use it for the glory of God, for the unification of God's people, to bring God's people together. He said, you should have discernment of spirit enough to know that man, he's heading in the right direction. He's right with God because his motive and his objective is right. And I think in the, in the Christian world, we should be looking at that because I'm really tired of it in the message as well. Just all of the things that rise up and you've got to follow this. I've seen it. I mean, you know, starting when I first got in the message, it was the seven thunders. And then it was, you have to follow Lee Vale. And then you have to follow, you know, Philip Kaku, you know, Kuku. And then you have to follow. I mean, it's, it's, it's playing. Brother James Bloom is there on there now. He was saying it to me yesterday about, you know, there's a website where they're trying to say, Brother Bram's gone. And he sent me the link. And I said, you see, like in the days of Martin Luther, Whenever this genuine seed is sown, here comes the devil behind sowing the seed of discrepancy, sowing the tares. He always does that. So he'll always come and sow his people into a, a, a message. You know, so there will be the genuine people, but in the end, there becomes so much fanaticism and so much other nonsense all around that if you're not careful, you'll think the whole thing is false. But it's the scarecrow. You know, the devil uses those. But the way you are told by the scripture, try their spirit. Not the anointing, but the spirit in the man. What is his aim? What is he trying to achieve? Is he trying to come and break up other people's churches so everyone must follow him? 
well, then he's got the wrong spirit because, you know, that's, that's not what we instructed to do in the word. You know? Does that answer what, what you're looking for, sister? Yeah. Thank you. you know, Brian, Andrew, could I say something too? Please, Brother Wilma, yeah. <laughs> yeah, the, the thing you are saying is, is, is even happening now in Zimbabwe as well. Yeah. Real good people, like, you know, and this past two weeks I have received so many calls and messages from friends, believers that I worshipped with. Yeah. And every, the first one was like, do you believe in the operation of the spirit in the church, you know? Yeah, yeah. I was like, hey, of course I do. <laughs> How can I not, you know? Do you believe in the gifts of the Holy Spirit operating in the church? I said, of course I do. You know, the first time I didn't, I was like, I've been a message believer for so many years, and the same as this brother, he ought to know that, you know? <laughs> but as, as we began to talk more and more, then I realized that, like now, this brother says to me, oh, I never knew I could speak in tongues and interpret, you know, and so forth. I said, oh, that's wonderful, you know. <laughs> then the next person, the same thing, and everybody is pushing me and saying, have you received the Holy Ghost? You know, the time is late, what, 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 you need to speak in tongues. And I'm like, hey, <laughs> you know, tongues and interpretation is not the only gift, you know. <laughs> it's the beast of the gifts, you know, that's the thing, man. But now it seems as if fellow message believers are trying to classify and say, if you haven't spoken in tongues, and this is something happening now, you know. And the I'm pressure like, from denomination. But yeah. Yeah. It's the pressure from denomination. You know those church, they used to speak yeah. about yeah. You know, in the message, people, they feel pressure. Yeah. It's like I said in the beginning, bro, before you came, is that, when it's speaking about this, a season of the former or the latter rain, uh -huh. the scripture says, ask ye the Lord rain in the season of the latter rain. So uh -huh. when it's a season and you ask seasonably, do you receive the genuine promise? But yes. Satan will always try to pressure people to say, you know, now's the time. You need this. You need that. And, yeah. But this is Christ and that is Christ. Let's follow this. He's in the desert. You, Jesus says, don't follow those things. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I think it's, it really does bring it to what you're saying there, brother woman, that, uh, you know, Satan, the, the generations change, but the, his tactics don't change. Yeah, they're still the same. Yeah. You know, you'll use it, and, and it gets closer and closer home, and you'll be surprised. I've heard that in the, in the message so many times through the years, bro, that yeah. you have to have this, you have to have this manifestation. Did you do this? Did you do that? Did you do that? <laughs> Or you have to follow this revelation, or did you understand? Ah, bro, I just got tired of it. And, and, and I took that quote. If God wants you to have, if you're his child, he'll bring it to you. you yeah, that's right. Be faithful before him and everything that God has for you, you'll never hold back from his children, bro. That's true, yeah. But we manufacture the revival like Sarah and Hagar. We want to manufacture something now. And you get you get uh, something you were not get looking for. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good point, bro. That's what I'm saying. It's relevant in every age. Rajot? I said it's manifesting time also. Remember, you said the form of the latter yeah. rain, so now it's the manifesting time. And, and it's like Brother Nanda sent that one today. I mean, God hides in humility. God is humble. The God is simple. When people come and put pressure on you, I remember by David Nash, the first time he came and preached, he preached for Brother Tommy. He preached a message called the simplicity that is in Christ. And he took it from Galatians chapter 1 when Paul said, there are some coming to trouble you, to take you away from the simplicity that is in Christ. Amen. When people come, they want to like trouble you in spirit, like Paul said. The say his coming has already happened and stuff. You know, that's happening in Paul's day. You, you, when people come to like, take you out of your rest in Christ. You come and say, no, you have to do something now. You know, Like when Saul said to David, you can't fight the battle like that. You must put on my armor. <laughs> but where were you when there was the lion? Where were you when there was the bear? I mean, I know my God. I know how he called me. I know how he's trained me. I mean, I don't need to put your armor on me. Maybe your armor is good for you, but I don't need your armor. Thanks for offering, but I'll use what I've proved. And I think that is, that is the principle we need to do. rest in the Lord. And he's proved himself to you. He's taken you through things. You've seen the lion, you've seen the bear. 
I mean, if there's a Goliath, well, let's trust in the Lord for the Goliath as well. Amen. I think let's not push it too far there, saints. Anybody else want to finish off with something? Brian Max, I can see you looking eagerly there to say something. Oh, well, I wanted to ask my precious brother, um, Wilmore. Yes. Yes, sir. After he's back and everything okay. I'm back. I, ha I had to leave Sister Julie in the hospital. Mm. Uh, they sent her to Rotunda Hospital, which is a maternity hospital. Uh -huh. So the test that they have done there, they say that the back pain has got nothing to do with the pregnancy. So they say they will keep her tonight, but if things don't change tomorrow, they will send her to an adult hospital where they, can, they want to do an MRI scan or something like that. Uh, so she's in the hospital. We'll hear more tomorrow morning then to, to know whether she's going to an adult hospital or maybe she has improved. But it looks like um, she's going to stay there tonight anyhow. Yeah. yeah. We will still keep on praying for Absolutely. our sister. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, Brother Max, why don't you finish for us in a word of prayer as well, as prayer as well please, Brother Max. And God bless you, Stan. So it's really nice to be with you once again. We do appreciate it. Just one thing before we finish. Would it suit everybody? Would somebody be put out if you change it to a Wednesday? So Christina, would that suit you? Uh, yeah, that's okay. Anyway, oh, no, 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 no. Um, it went there, so we have our church service on Wednesday, yeah. Okay, we'll see. Maybe we might switch it then to another night, maybe a Tuesday or something. I, I, we'll see as we go. But, Brian Max, you can pray for us, and God bless you richly. Right? <coughs> our dear Lord, we thank you once again. And Lord, uh, set us down to open your word, Lord, unto us. The true word is always a light. And this evening, we've had the light of the word to separate whatever darkness we might have engulfed ourselves in. Amen. Lord, we thank you that we have these kinds of teachings to help us to re-examine the type of seed we have sown. Amen. Lord, if we need to do the right things, so back the right seed of God, Lord, we pray that you help us, Lord. Amen. That this evening, we sow the true seed of repentance yes. with a broken spirit, a broken and a contrite heart. Amen. Something that, Lord, in the end, we will have as the true seed of God. Amen. Lord, we thank you that these teachings, Lord, Father, continue to open your word to us that we will always move on the path of righteousness for the time, Lord. Amen. Father, we thank you for our pastor. Give him to your hands. Lord, you continue to use him for the bride. Thank you, the Lord. All the things that, Lord, you have done for us so far, it has been so great and so wondrous and a blessing to all of us, Lord. Father, thank you. We bless you. We give all the glory to you. Amen. As even, Lord, we commit the rest of the week, Lord, into your hands. Amen. Pray that, Lord, even tomorrow, we, as we have the, uh, prayer meetings, we ask that, Lord, as in before we come to that meeting, you know the needs of your people, yes. the issues and the uh, request that, Lord, is upon their hearts of God. We pray the Lord, you meet each and every one according to your riches in glory. We pray the Lord, you give grant us the anointing and the inspiration through your word of God, that our prayer and our utterances, Lord, will be according to what already, Lord, you have willed for us, Lord. Father, we commit tomorrow's meeting also into your hands, Lord. Even tonight, Lord, even as time for us to rest. We pray the Lord, even in our sleep of God, Father, let us have a contact channel whereby, Lord, even you can speak to us in our dreams, Lord. Father, we pray the Lord, you keep us through the night. And if tomorrow, Lord, it will be a time for us to continue another day, 
the Lord all is in your hands, God. Amen. We thank you. We bless you, Lord. Committing every home, Lord, into your hands. Lord, you continue in this time that we have now. That our shutting with you, we know the Lord, it has been a true blessing, God. Father, continue to bless each home, sustain each home, the children, Lord, in your hands. Pray that to God in these unusual times, which we know that, Lord, it is all a divine purpose. Let us come out of God, the real blessed people of God, thy Lord. Yes, Lord. Once again, we say thank you, bless you, give all the glory to you. As Lord, we expect once again next week to continue with the teachings. We bless your name. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 God bless saints. Meet some of you tomorrow at lunchtime. Otherwise, tomorrow's prayer meeting. Let's keep it in prayer. Let's keep Sister Julie in prayer, especially. And God bless you richly, saints. Awesome. Amen. Yes, right. Right. Link as soon as possible, then I can. Because Fergal, oh, for to email, he doesn't. He doesn't have a, a, a mobile, so I email him the link. Okay, I'll ask Brother Will. Could you draw us a link for tomorrow lunchtime, please, Brother Willie? Yeah, I think I'm gonna do the same way again. Just make a recurring meeting. That's fine. Thanks so much. Okay. God bless you. God bless you, Thank you very much, Pastor. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. So, Thank you. Brother Will. Thank you. Bravo. 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 How are you doing? Good, how are you? You're looking well. <laughs> <laughs> yes, that's it. God bless you. Yes, how are you? Yes, mm -hmm. How are you all doing? How are you doing well? I just I, 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 I escape and come here. <laughs> <laughs> we all will pack our bags. <laughs> All the fellow people in my house here. Amen. God bless you. God bless you. Bye bye. 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 Hey. Oh, Matteo. Matteo, buonasera. Ah, buonasera. Siete benedica. Matteo. Mm. Nice. 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 Uh, go for it.